And I'm really very happy that we have a very distinguished speaker who will deliver a keynote address to us as the Council of Members. And I ask you to welcome with me Professor David Molnieu from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, the Center for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Well, <clears throat> Chair, members of IAPB Council, let me first thank you for the kind invitation to address you. I have chosen a title, having had discussions with, with Peter and colleagues, because he asked me to try and reflect on what's happened in neglected tropical diseases over the last decade, um, so IAPB might learn some lessons. I have to say, when I hear learned lessons in any area, but particularly in science and health, I'm very skeptical because my belief is that we rarely learn lessons. Uh, we rarely learn lessons in international health. We rarely learn lessons in politics. But my title is Building Platforms, Raising Profiles, and Learning Lessons as Recipes for Success. Now, a decade ago, let me see if I can get it right. <clears throat> as far as infectious diseases con were concerned, this is a slide I show regularly, and I apologize to colleagues who've seen it before. If you were approaching Earth as an alien, you would believe that there are only three diseases on the planet, HIV, malaria, and TB. Because a decade ago, the Global Fund had just been launched, and those were the diseases that uh, the world was focusing on. I may say something more about the issue of equity in this context in a minute. But certainly, for those of us who've been in parasitic diseases, infectious diseases, for rather longer than the last decade, um, we see diseases which blind, which you're particularly interested, um, trachoma and onco in particular, as NTDs. Um, and we've been blind to the opportunity and the achievements in many of these areas. And I believe policymakers have been disabled by the belief, as expressed in the last slide, that only three diseases actually matter. And hence, these diseases have been ignored by policymakers. But if we're serious about alleviating poverty from the poorest billion people on the planet, the interaction of these diseases in terms of blindness, disablement and disfigurement, and deformity and stigma are pretty profound. And all these things interact, not just in terms of health and disability, but also depriving people of educational opportunities, of uh, being effective in their communities, um, in terms of social interactions, and in terms of actually reducing agricultural productivity. Now, in 2005, one of Tony Baer's achievements, and there were not many, were that there was a Glen Eagles re, uh, presentation of the report uh, by the Commission for Africa. And we managed to get a statement in there that donors should ensure that there is adequate funding for the treatment of and prevention of parasitic diseases and micronutrient deficiency, and that there was some funding provided uh, for global health partnerships to begin integrating these activities into public health campaigns. That was a starting point. But before that, there was a meeting in Berlin of various partners, including WHO, where the concept and the word neglected tropical diseases together was uh, developed to try and encompass those diseases which affected literally billions of people certainly at least one, million, one billion people, and with many more at risk. And those people were definitely the poorest parts of the world and the communities. Now, what were the platforms which enabled us to go forward and move forward and create a momentum? Well, first of all, and you're very well aware of this, the long-term donations from pharmaceutical companies, starting, of course, with Merck in 1988. And the value of those I've calculated, although there's some dispute about value, uh, is of around two 
to $3 billion annually, if you add them all up. We also created the NTD brand because Joe Public out there can't pronounce onchocerciasis, can't pronounce schistosomiasis, doesn't know what lymphatic filariasis is, nor does they know about dracunculiasis. So these words needed to be brought together to some kind of brand because these, there is a commonality about these diseases, uh, be it in terms of the people who they affect or, or the approach you can have to strategic issues around control. The other important issue is you have to have consistent messaging. And as a previous speaker's mentioned, these link to the MDGs and the poverty agenda 20, 2000 to 2015. My view about these diseases, if they affect a sixth of the planet as they do, how can you make any impact on poverty if you don't address the most prevalent infections of that bottom billion? It's not logical. We have also had leadership from WHO with the recent production of the roadmap and disease strategies themselves, and in 2012, in January, the London Declaration. But we've also had other elements to these platforms. As we see at this meeting, we've got a huge number of NGDOs here, and we've had a limited amount, insufficient but significant, of bilateral support. Now, it is amazing to me having been initially involved in the NTD discussions, that every year now, the NGDOs associated with NTDs are coming together and there's over 300 people in Brighton. That is a staggering momentum. And one of the critical issues is maintaining it. We're also benefiting from compelling partnerships. And as far as the message is concerned, which I've already heard during this session, we're talking about issues of universal health coverage and access to essential medicines. All the donated medicines from the pharmaceutical companies are in the WHO class of essential medicines. So there's an issue of a right to those medicines from the poorest people. And we really do have, in my view, a development case of the bottom billion who are most disenfranchised and have least access to health care. And the other important issue, as we know, particularly from the onchocerciasis control programs, is that the level of involvement of communities who actually drive the demand for the products such as ivermectin. This is a concept of creating the NTD brand identity. <clears throat> it does bring it bring with it responsibilities uh, which I've alluded to in this paper. But the important point is we now have a brand which we have to maintain. We've also been associated with strong WHO leadership. And Margaret Chan really does believe that this is an important issue. And I think she's using NTDs as a flagship. We managed to get through the Executive Board and the World Health Assembly a resolution on NTDs in May. That was a real breakthrough, and the world signed up to it. This was a speech she gave in 2007 at an Afro-regional meeting, but two weeks ago she was in Brazzaville at the regional meeting of African Ministers in health, of Health and asked the regional director she wanted monthly reports on guinea worm for all the still endemic countries. And she said in a private meeting, and I quote one of my sources, she wants action and results. She doesn't expect WHO's role to be about convening meetings. She expects it to see countries coming back to the point that was made earlier, countries committing to action. Now we have the World Health Assembly resolution. Okay, the role of pharma. You're only too well aware of this, but this is quite remarkable. This is where the two billion comes from, dollars per year. Long-term commitments, quality products, most of them off patent, and being made available for poor people, all essential medicines. I'll come back to that as a point later. 
But also, this is just the Global Alliance for Lymphatic Filariasis, the numbers of partners who are involved in the Global Alliance and supporting the global program. The diversity of partners on the one hand, but also the numbers of them working in all the endemic areas. And it's donor agencies, it's international organizations, it's NGOs, it's academia, and so on. Uh, pharmaceuticals, of course. And this is a disease, lymphatic filariasis, which now has three donated drugs, SI with DEC, ivermectin from Merck, and albendazole from GSK. This is a unique situation, that three major pharma provide the drugs for one disease. I've mentioned the poverty agenda. When you look at the NTDs and look at the problems they pose, they are all interrelated with at least uh, four or five of the Millennium Development Goals. Now, when it comes to science, obviously, and evidence, the evidence base is critical. Um, Gro Brundtland, who was the, one of the previous Director General, said, good science is the basis for good public health. But this is the issue. The challenge we face is to translate the best science into public health. Now, I've been involved with rather long in this area for rather longer than I care to believe. Um, very few products move from the bench to the field in a generation. Very few. And that is a real challenge. How do we move fast the quality products, if they're applicable, into field settings and implementation? Now, as far as the rationale is concerned for NTD control, I think this comes back to consistent messaging. We need to emphasize we're targeting the poorest people on the planet who are most at risk but have least access to healthcare. That the interventions, particularly for the diseases which are controlled or eliminated by preventive chemotherapy, annual distribution of free drugs, um, are pro-poor. There's no distinction or discrimination. So that addresses an equity issue. It also addresses a human rights issue which has been tackled in Uganda by Paul Hunt, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, when he addressed issues of filariasis and leprosy. And I'm sure that applies also to people who are um, at risk of preventable blindness. And well, also, of course, these drugs have an educational impact. Now, preventive chemotherapy, as expressed, for example, in onchocerciasis, is cheap, it's safe, and it's cost-effective. And the other benefit in terms of the messaging for these diseases is we know it works. There are proven successes out there which are well published in the peer-reviewed literature and you can measure the results. Onchocerciasis is one, schistosomiasis in Egypt is another, lymphatic filariasis in China is another, and so on. Massive successes upon which the community can build. Every year since 2010, for the diseases amenable to chemotherapy, there have been 700 million plus annual treatments in over 70 countries. That is a huge public health success, but nobody's touting it as much as they should. And it is based very much on public-private partnerships. As part of the messaging, we know from economic studies that the economic rates of return are between 15 and 30%. It varies, but they're in that ballpark area. The unit costs of delivery, again, vary, uh, and we say between 10 and 60 cents per year, person per year. That's what it costs to deliver a free drug. But if you look at the annual per capita health expenditure and even the poorest countries in Africa, where you're talking about 20 to 20 to 30 dollars per person per year spent by the government on health, if you look at what it costs to deliver these drugs, which the WHO Afro region suggests are between 10 and 20 cents, that's only 1% of the national health expenditure 
could be spent on delivery of essential medicines. Now that seems to me to be an equitable distribution of resource. We know also that these diseases, these drugs have multiple impacts. If you give ivermectin and albendazole, you impact on both intestinal helminths and scabies, you have an impact on anemia, and if you use praziquantil, you may have an impact on HIV transmission. We also know that the distributions are sustainable, either by community-based or school-based delivery. And we know that the donated drugs are of high quality. What is important about that is that of the drug donations approved, and I know Adrian Hopkins is in the room, so I've got to be careful, I believe this is a hugely important statistic. Of the drugs approved by the donation programs in any one year, 70% reach people's mouths. If you go to World Bank figures of drug attrition, studies in the 1990s by Koyi Ransom Kuti, the attrition of drugs in a health system in Africa was 88%. So compare 12% getting to people's mouths compared with 70%. That is a huge achievement and shows that actually communities want to sustain access and delivery of these drugs. So talking about raising profiles in the context of this meeting and the future, first of all, we're talking about blindness. We're talking about blindness as well as disability. And I want to add to that something we've been looking at and working on, and that's mental health. When people are blind, when people are disabled, when people are stigmatized, they suffer exactly the same problems of people suffering from mental health disorders. And that is a burden of our diseases which is essentially ignored when we calculate disease burden. Anybody who is depressed, severely or moderately depressed, the weighting score for depression in the World Health Organization statistics is between 0.4 and 0.6. So if you're depressed associated with these diseases, be it you as an individual or a carer, then that is a huge burden and weighting which we as a community are ignoring. We've got to continue creating and maintaining and promoting the NTD brand and we have to continue to evolve our thinking. We can't stay still and we need to maintain the advocates who've been so supportive over recent years. Margaret Chan, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, Jeff Sachs, and many others. The London Declaration was a landmark when there was significant commitments from DFID, from the WHO in production of the roadmap, from Bill Gates, from operational research, and from pharma, as well as countries. And that commitment was to achieve roadmap goals which are enshrined by WHO, to sustain and expand programs, etc. Now, we need to advance research and development for the next generations of products, urgently. But if you have a product, you've got to get it to people. And that is where the translational research is important. I do believe, and I'll move on, using Margaret Chan's remarks at the World Health Assembly this year, we need to package NTDs slightly differently. In the context of free drugs being available and people's entitlement to access them uh, as essential medicines and contributing to health coverage. In some communities being treated for river blindness, this is the only government provided service they have and they collect the drugs from the districts or from the health centers. 50% of those treatments or around 50% of the treatments for river blindness take place more than 20 kilometers from any health facility. So we're talking about demand-driven access to essential medicines here, which is not going to be achieved, in my view, any other way. When we published one of our first papers in PLOS Medicine in 19, sorry, 2005, we pointed out the unit costs for providing these drugs. And that bottom small bar is the unit cost of treatment per year for 
NTDs compared with malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. Now, when it comes to equity, oh, this is the picture uh, I wanted to show you of the 70% access to Mectizan over a period of years. It fluctuates, obviously. So 70% of the drugs that are approved by the Mectizan donation program reach people's mouths. That's a huge achievement. When it comes to equity, my colleague Bernard Lisa at Georgetown University and formerly the World Bank did this. He looked at what was going in terms of official development assistance to health and showed that only 0.6% of official development assistance for health goes towards controlling neglected tropical diseases. Despite the fact they affect more than one billion people. Now that doesn't seem to me to be very equitable. So where are the opportunities in the future? Well, we know that the Cameron report does include NTDs at the present time, as well as HIV, TB, and malaria. We know we have a World Health Assembly resolution which calls on all countries to uh, achieve roadmap targets, and so bringing countries on board, resourcing their programs themselves. We know that the regional committee meetings of resolutions on NTDs. We know that there is advocacy activities going on, and I hope a IAPB will be part of that. We know we have continuing donations from pharma and the remaining commitment for the CEOs. And I just want to point out that the proportion of the national spend need only be between 1% and 2% of total national spend if countries were to contribute to deliver these essential medicines. Now, I just want to highlight the challenges. First of all, we've got to increase the rate of upscaling. As I said this morning, we're, there's an implementation deficit now of about 350 million people if we're to achieve the WHO targets by 2015. That can be identified as about six countries. So that means that if we reach those targets, we have to scale up and increase sustainably the numbers of people treated per month by 10 to 12 million in countries like Nigeria, DRC, Ethiopia. We have issues of coverage and compliance. We have the familiar problems of low ISIS in Central Africa. And as far as the partnership is concerned, whilst the partnerships are extremely robust, the cost of managing partnerships is actually quite intensive. Not in cash terms, but in human resource terms uh, and in discussion terms and networking terms. Um, the big fear is if there are new tools out there, and there are not many, if any, how do we get them to the market quickly? We are likely to encounter, regrettably, reduced drug efficacy, efficacy as we reach the end game. So we have to be prepared for that. And also we have to look at how we integrate vector control, particularly for filariasis, uh, as well as treating urinary schistosomiasis to uh, reduce the risks of HIV. We are have to upscale morbidity management for filariasis, but also trichiasis surgery, uh, where there's a big deficit. Um, we have to look at the elimination targets and be realistic about whether we can achieve them. That particularly applies to visceral leishmaniasis in Asia and sleeping sickness in Central Africa. And we need to continue with robust monitoring and evaluation surveillance and update our tools when needed. But this will come at a cost, and donors may not be prepared for that, particularly when it comes to issues of verification and certification. Um, we've got to maintain, through our successes, Margaret Chan's interests, because she is a key advocate. We've got to keep World Bank commitments and hold them to them. And we have this issue of the relationship between APOC and other NTDs, which is becoming an important issue beyond 2015. Um, we need more donors from outside the US-UK axis. 
The Eurozone is clearly a target, but Greece, Portugal and Spain are not going to contribute to this. We have to have a momentum somewhere in the Eurozone, as well as the Yen Zone. And we have to be cautious about the change of ministers in DFID or parties in this country and the President in the US. Now, it comes to innovation. Many people think about innovation as people in white coats producing new drugs. But the NTD community have been particularly impressive in innovating in the simplest way. The dose pole is one example. The drinking straw to stop guinea worm transmission. Health education messages, again for guinea worm, an exercise book on the left, which is given to all children in Burkina Faso so they know how they acquire guinea worm and how you stop it. Hugely effective health education tool and material available in the markets which, for guinea worm which women can buy. Cameron and the presidents of Indonesia and Liberia have put in their latest report, where is this thing? If you see the bit in red, you'll remember that one of the health targets was control of HIV, malaria, and other diseases. We've now taken the NTDs out of other diseases. We have, with TB, had them specified in the Cameron submission to the UN Secretary General. We hope it will continue to be in there because that will give us an extra platform beyond 2015. I believe it's critical. I believe we've made some progress. So for the next decade, we need to maintain the momentum. Remember these drugs are essential medicines to which people have the right to access. If we're to go to universal health coverage, they have to be part of that package. We need to be innovative and continue to be so. We have to build capacity. We cannot deliver that 350 million extra tablets we need to do per year if we don't have the capacity in the countries and particularly at the district and sub-district level. We have to challenge the targets. Are we achieving them? Because if we're not achieving them, we better say so. Because we better examine ourselves in that context. And if possible, if we can, implement new science. So to conclude, I have this sentiment. If we cannot deliver free drugs to poor people, we are unlikely to be able to solve the other more complex issues of international health. NTDs are low-hanging fruit with proven records of success. Control, elimination, or near eradication. We have an obligation as a community to maintain that momentum. And thank you very much for the opportunity of talking to you.